Hello, I'm Bill Hanson, director at the Max Planck Institute for Chemical Ecology in Jena. Here on this image you see a robber crab or a coconut crab, and that's really the world's largest land-living arthropod. That means that it's, it's the largest insect, it's the largest crustacean, it's the largest spider ever found on Earth today. The interesting thing about these guys is that they seem to really to find their way around with the help of smells. And living crabs have only been up in the terrestrial environment for about 5 million years, which is a blink in the light of evolutionary time. So we want to understand how have they evolved their olfactory system, their sense of smell, and how do they use it to find their way, to find food, to find each other on Christmas Island. We usually start out our expeditions in Singapore, so that's where everyone comes together from different parts. We are collaborating with Professor Stefan Hartsch in Greifswald, and he comes with his group. This time we also had the participants from Tübingen, from uh, Portugal, and uh, as you see here, my family always takes part in these expeditions to being field assistants in, in different ways. So from Singapore, we take Boeing 737 out to the island. There is uh, the world's fifth most dangerous landing place. So you have three trials. If you don't make it in those three trials, then you have to turn around and fly back to Jakarta. So far, we always got down. You see part of the island here. It's an old coral island that has risen out of the sea. And in this way, it has become terraced. So you can see the different land elevations of the island. We are on Christmas Island. Here you see uh, the, the license plate and you see some of the prevalent uh, organisms. The leopard shark or the whale shark, the red crab and the tropic bird. These are sort of sign animals of Christmas Island. And we are as far east as you get in the Indian Ocean, just on the border between the Indian Ocean and the Pacific, below Java in Indonesia. But we are in Australian territory. The first thing we have to do is to plan what we're going to do and uh, usually we don't have access to any very sophisticated materials. You, ha you have to take what you have and here is an old banana box that has become the background to the whole plan of what we're going to do on the crabs during the coming years. Our vehicles are usually old beat up Toyota trucks that you can either borrow from the national parks on the island or we rent them from a, from a local uh, renter. We have to move a lot through the rainforest looking for crabs, sometimes even crawling into trees to try to figure out where they're hanging around. They often hide all day, so if you want to find them you have to, you have to be willing to enter the forest in earnest. Here we were catching some crabs, often they escaped inside the car. Here you see a crab just hanging on to the inside of our field vehicle. Here is a nice close-up shot of a crab. You see that they can come in almost any color, from bright orange to blue to turquoise to red to brown. You also see in the, in the front of the crab the eyes, of course, the little knobs. But then you see two different kinds of appendages. One very straight, going straight out to the right. That's the mechano, that's for, for, for touch, touching things. And then you see some angled structures, two of them in the middle. These are the smelling parts, and actually the very outer part of those is where the crab smells. So here the marking has started. We work with GPS tracking, and this whole thing is a background to understanding the chemical ecology. So we, under, we want to understand how they move against odors, how they find objects, how they find their way around their environment. But to understand this, first we wanted to track them and see what do they really do, because no one really knows how they move around. They're very long-lived. Do they have territories? Do they move to some specific place to mate? And so on and so forth. So here we have started this marking procedure. So first, roughing up the back of the crab so that we can really stick something to it. Here we're holding down a crab, we have uh, used the sandpaper and we're starting to put the uh, tracking device on. But first the crab has to be clean, we're cleaning it up with acetone, getting all fat away. Here you really have to watch out because the crabs has about twice our jaw pressure in their left claw. So uh, last year I got stuck with my thumb and it took about three months to get any sensation back. And that was a small crab, so a big crab will easily take your finger off. So, so you have to watch out while you're dealing with them. Now the crab has been released. 
and then twice a day at least we have to move up and down the island trying to get in contact. So you have to get within about 50 meters range to download all the data that the little backpack on the crab has gathered. When you do that, often you get a big reward because you get to see exactly what this crab did during the last week. We could see that the, the big males that are often 50, 60 years old, they move up and down the island. It seems like they go down to the beach to drink salt water, which they still need for their molting when they're going to build up a new shell. But it also seems like they go down to the beach to meet the girls and, and to mate because uh, the, the females, they lay their eggs in the ocean. That's the only part of the life of these crabs that is still tied to the ocean. Okay, so then we got an indication that these crabs are really moving through a very, very densely vegetated area where no one more or less had gone through before. So we had to penetrate this area very, very jungle-like, very razor-sharp leaves that will cut you up. So you really have to cut your way through with machete, cover yourself up from, from top to toe, and then just push through. When we came out, we came out to a terrace like this one, really a fascinating moon-like landscape where the crab seems to move out and then they sit out there and drink salt water because here they can approach the ocean in a safer way. They can move down channels where salt water seems to bubble up into the island. We move on in our field vehicles through the rainforest. We're moving up to a place called the Dales, which is also a good crab place. These fascinating Tahitian chestnut trees with snake-like roots growing into big swamps, like on, on this picture here. Here my son is climbing down the lianas. You see it's uh, more or less living like Tarzan in the jungle. We're trying to approach the ocean again to understand how the crabs move. Where do they go down to actually reach the ocean sometimes? Because we see a lot of cliffs and it's very hard for them to get down unless there are these tunnels that we talked about before. But here we found a canyon that was moving down through these lianas and then you're actually, what you're seeing in front here is the sea. So here the crabs have the possibility to approach salt water for egg laying, for drinking salt water, for mating, and so on. We're also trying to understand what other things do the crabs really eat. And one thing that they really favor, that they love, are the Arenga palm trees. This is a local endemic palm species, and it's very full of stuff that the crabs love to eat. So here you see a whole gang that has gathered on a log that we have cut open. And then they eat the inside of these trees. This tree has a very special odor as well, which I will come back to a bit later on. And the interesting thing is also that after a few days, the log will start fermenting, alcoholic fermentation. And, and after four or five days, the crabs get really drunk. Here two crabs have found a coconut uh, that I have opened up just by order. So we kept it concealed and they could smell it uh, all the way up from the forest and were coming crawling to find it. Here they get another guy is coming up to try to steal it from them and often it becomes a very intense competition so, and one guy will win and pull the coconut up into the forest and eat it. Our last experiment this time was to really try to understand how the crabs use odors to find their food and to find each other and so on. So we established a base camp down on the beach where the big male crabs hang around. Here is the laboratory preparing the odor sources so we brought a lot of different odors that might be relevant for these crabs as food cues and then we let them smell it and then we observed what they were doing. Here we're doing the actual experiment so you see the the plastic thing to the right with a little sponge on it there we have put the odor and this is actually one of the main odors that is emitted by this palm tree that we talked about before the Arenga palm tree. And this is extremely active and in attracting the, the crabs. So if you put this out on the beach, they will come running from up in the forest, 50, 100 meters, just to get to this odor source. The last experiment I want to show is, is just how we're trying to understand the mating strategy. And they always mate at night, so we had to work in the dark. A mating had never really been observed before this instance that I will show you here. So here we, here we just found a female that looks receptive. Then we went up into the forest and caught a big male and we got to observe this very interesting behavior. So the male 
grabs the female, turns her over and crawls on top of her, missionary style, and mates. So this is actually one of the very, very first images of a mating between two of these giant crabs. You can imagine it's a big risk for the female because this is a male weighing four or five kilos with an enormous power just to cut her head open or kill her on the spot. So there has to be some really good interplay between these two before they, they come into the position that you see here. Here we end uh, our journey over Christmas Island. Here is again a view from the terrace just when we got through the jungle. An amazing experience where we got to understand a lot more about the crabs, how they move around. And as I said, what we really want to understand is how do you evolve an olfactory system so fast, over five million years. If you look at the relatives of these crabs that still live in the water, their brain is, looks pretty normal when it comes to olfaction when it comes to the sense of smell. But these guys that you have seen here, the big crabs, their brain has totally exploded with olfactory tissue. More or less half the brain is now devoted to smelling. So smell means a lot to these guys. And what we are trying to understand is how do you evolve such a system and how do you use it in the setting that we see on Christmas Island.